on Central News tonight, Tauranga Te Reo, the big decisions for Hamilton Council and Toby Dale's fight for growth hormone. Welcome to Central News for Thursday the 4th of December. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Moana Iwi radio announcer Pat Spellman has been on a bit of a journey to make Tauranga the first bilingual city in New Zealand. And finally, after hard work and a bit of hostility, the first signs have been printed. Yes, well, we've, uh, we've essentially sort of got to the, to the finish point in one of the three phases. Um, sort of depending on how familiar you are with the Tauranga Te Reo concept, there were three phases and one of them, the biggest sort of chunk of it was the uh, bilingual signage that we were hoping to erect throughout Tauranga and Mount Maunganui and sort of some of the, some of the places in, in our city and we got to a point now where we can start sort of, um, you know, putting them up and, and, and so we're celebrating the, the final leg of that phase. The council have come on board then? Yeah, I mean it was a bumpy ride to be fair and a lot of it sort of maybe was... Um, established by the fact that obviously there was going to be a bit of uproar if the council spent a dollar because that's sort of what happens when you spend a dollar here, people cry about it. So what we thought we'd do is we'd uh, ensure that the council didn't really come on board in terms of rate payer subsidies and using any real rate payers cash because we didn't sort of want that controversial element to it. So what the council have since done is sort of supported us throughout that whole consultation phase and ensuring that if we need any support when it comes to uh, even just advice or, or you know around the sort of the regulatory reform in terms of putting things up and helping us with that sort of stuff, they'll be really, really cool. So I'm um, very fortunate that we've got a cooperative city council when it comes to ensuring the cultural diversity of our city. Let's hope they continue to subscribe to that kaupapa. Now, as you said, there was a bit of uproar about the kaupapa when it first was announced. Yeah. Tell me about that. Oh, that was to be expected though. You know, we, we jumped into a pond that was generally, um, you know, pretty, um, not, not, uh, for want of a better term, but they were sort of set in their ways. And so, uh, so a few feathers were ruffled when I came in and I said, look, I want to put some bilingual signs up. The first thing I think was around a lack of knowledge in terms of the project itself. And that sort of, maybe there was a bit of miscommunication in terms of what we were trying to do. A lot of people assumed it was bilingual road signs and we were going to replace everything. And so you can understand there were a bit of, you know, ap there was a bit of apprehensive around, no, apprehension rather around that. But what, what once they sort of come to terms with what we're actually trying to do, I think a lot of mindset changed. There's always going to be those who don't who don't subscribe to that same you know positive outlook in terms of you know Māori language the Māori culture you know, Māori diversity but apart from that no everything's everything seems to be pretty cool which is cool so it has settled down then I think after you know things like Pukehinehina, the the, the Pukehinehina um, commemorations around Gate Park and the 150th year, things like Waitangi Day concerts, and um, you know the fact that Tiki Tane lives here now, I think people have just started to embrace Māori people, so it's a good thing. Now, perhaps, mo mostly people were upset about that rate payer money being spent, uh, so it's definitely not the case. No, no, not one dollar up until this point, and I used it um, cautiously because. To be honest, and I, and I want to ensure that, that we are totally transparent with this, uh, I'm assuming that the count, when, when the council set aside meetings and they talk to us and we're in the, in the meeting room with them for two hours, then we've used council money because they're there and they're talking to us so that their wages are being paid, so that's there, right? And so anyone who wants to split hairs and try and, you know, uh, be a bit of a nitpicker can use that theory and I'm totally open to that but in terms of a cheque being written to bankroll this this concept, no. And in fact no money from Tauranga City Council, the to uh, Western Bay Plenty Council, the Regional Council, uh, the three uh, iwi in Tauranga Moana didn't contribute any anything in, in, you know, in terms of money so uh, there was no, no ratepayers money went into this other than ratepayers who decided to donate which was appreciated. Who are some of those donators? A lot of them were big companies who really just wanted to jump on board in, in an incognito fashion and sort of just support it and, and one of them uh, we go, we're going to sort of unveil the, the, the name and the sort of brand of our, our biggest sponsor when we do start you know, erecting these signs throughout the city. So we'll do that in due course and I hope people will get behind these these really generous sponsors and donors and support them the way that they've supported us in this concept and, and this project. So yeah, I'll, I'll tell you when I'm allowed. But yeah, no, they're locals and they're really good people. Visit the Facebook page Tauranga Te Reo to Tautoko this kaupapa. And our next story, 2014 is coming to a close. But there are still some big decisions to be made before Christmas for Hamilton City Council, including the proposed sale of the pensioner flats, 
and the proposed change to rating values. Anne-Marie spoke with Mayor Julie Hardacre about these big decisions. So before Christmas we've got a couple of really big decisions that the council's going to make and that's on the rating, whether we're going to change from land value to capital value. And we've also got uh, a decision to make about our pensioner housing, whether we're going to retain our pensioner housing or we're going to sell it. So those are enormous decisions for the council. Um, so we've been working on those all year. And of course, large, uh, you know, lots of public consultation has been going on and we've had hearings on those. So now, time to make a decision. So we've got those. We've also got a lot of decisions to make about the arts sector. We're looking uh, for a decision prior to Christmas about our Clarence Street Theatre and what we're going to do about that. Um, you know, we had a theatres review done about 18 months ago, looking at our theatres in the city and how we might uh, deliver better. So we've been working through each of the recommendations in that report and now we're up to Clarence Street Theatre, so lots of talk going on about that. So there's some big ones as we sort of head into the new year. The other thing we're doing is um, we're going to have the first cut of our draft budget for the next 10 years. So that will come before the council in December, early December. So lots of work's been going on about that because we're growing fast and we've got to look at how much all the infrastructure costs and how we service all that growth. So some big stuff before we even get to Christmas. <laughs> what development can we expect to see with Hamilton Gardens in 2015? Yeah, so we've been working this year on uh, the Hamilton Gardens proposal and um, we're going to be putting an application into the Lotteries Commission um, for a significant amount of funding for that project. So I think next year will be a lot of work at the Hamilton Gardens. We've, um, we do the gardens in stages. Uh, each you know, garden we sort of start. Generally the gardens have a couple of stages in them and we try to keep them rotating. So there'll be a lot of work I think going on in the gardens next year. The Surreal Garden, which is the robotics plants, um, that one I think is underway now. Because a lot of these, the lead in time is often a couple of years for these things. So that'll be happening and of course our river plan will be we'll be really starting to look very closely at how we start a roll out of that. You know, that's a 30 year vision, it's not going to happen overnight, but there's quite a few projects that we want to get going early on, and I think people will start seeing some of that um, start next year. So, you know, I think next year's going to be a big year for things happening. We've spent all of this year doing lots of making big decisions and doing lots of plans. Next year I think will be about how we start implementing those. You recently held a consultation afternoon on Victoria Bridge about the river plan. How did that go? Look, it was great um, because we've we've got our we've had our um, river plan out for the last month just to get feedback to see if the public are happy with where we've gone with it. It's been uh, a huge amount of work and. It looks fantastic and we've had some fantastic feedback. People are very excited about, for the first time for decades, um, we've actually got this plan finished now and there's a real, um, you know, it's, it's actually going to happen. And I think this is what the public is so excited about. It's actually going to happen because there's been a lot of attempts in the past but not quite got there. So we had a bit of a, a day on the, the bridge. We thought, well, we'll shut down the bridge and people can come and look at the plan and look at the, the river. And that was great, actually. And um, I think people really appreciated walking on the bridge and you know the connection with the river. So the idea, of course, in the river plan is that we'll all be getting up close with that river a lot more than we have in the past. This is our last catch up for 2014. What's your Christmas message to the people of Hamilton? You know, relax with your family. Um, when I talk to lots of people, and even on Saturday for our birthday party, I was talking to people, people, a lot of people have had a really big year. Lots of things have been going on, and I think people are looking forward to a rest. Actually taking time with their family and just, you know, doing what Kiwis do best. Chilling out at the beach and shutting off all those things that, you know, occupy us during the year. I was saying to someone this morning, What's so great about our country is that everything does shut down at Christmas time. It's our summer holidays. You don't have to worry about looking at your mobile devices and wondering about communicating because no one's doing that. We're all, we've all shut down. So, you know, have a great time with your family. For more details on any of these issues, go to hamilton.gov.nz. Up next, travelling to Ecuador to encourage happiness. Welcome back to Central News on TV Central. Natasha Cox is just 17 but has an outlook on life that maybe we could all learn from. Life is too short to be unhappy. The Bethlehem College student is currently fundraising to get to Ecuador where she will volunteer with children. Well, I think at the beginning of this year I decided that 
I wanted to take a year off before university um, to really do what makes me happy instead of having to put that aside for studies. And so I went along to Latitude Global Volunteering's information evening and I'd seen a pamphlet at my school and as soon as I was in the meeting I knew it was for me. There was a girl sharing about her experiences in Vietnam and it was it was just incredible and it just you know it made sense to me it's what I wanted to do. So originally I signed up to go to India to go volunteer um, in a disabled institution for children in Varanasi um, but because of difficulties with visas um, I changed to Ecuador um, and it's really about I love making people happy and I love serving other people and doing what I can for others and I think it was just about combining my love for traveling and wanting to help people and that what Latitude offered just was the perfect fit. So why Ecuador of all places? Well like I said it wasn't the original plan but um, after you know realizing that I needed to make another choice. I, I was looking through the brochure and it first of all looks beautiful as a country. Um, but second of all, the, the, the language especially, I wanted to be able to pick up a language and be proficient at a language and out, already learning French at school, um, Spanish, going to a Spanish speaking country where I could be immersed in the language just it seemed like an awesome opportunity. So it, it just seemed like a, a trifecta, being able to travel to a beautiful place, help incredible people and learn the language. So so do you know what kind of work you're actually going to be doing there? We haven't been informed of our official placements yet, but I'll be working in a schools or caring placement. So the awesome thing about the Ecuadorian placement is that you have the opportunity to work in a school teaching English or just helping with the children in the mornings and then work with street children in the afternoon. Um, as well as that, I could be working in care placements with children with physical disabilities, learning disabilities, and also the street children, um, the outreach program for them. So um, a really wide opportunity um, and the opportunity to do more, more than one of those, but ultimately just working with children that you know, need a little bit of love or need a little bit of, you know, t schools that need help or teachers that need a little bit of extra help or um, really I'm not, I'm not too phased about my exact placement. Um, I know I'll be able to make a child smile wherever I go and I think that's my aim. Working with troubled children might be quite difficult. Are you nervous about that? I guess any placement would come with its own challenges or dif um, difficulties. Um, and I guess there is that, you know, that barrier often between a child that's whether physically disabled, but I think being able to see the beauty in everyone and knowing that no matter if you are or you aren't, we're all worth the same thing and I think treating them with that, with that respect, um, as well as that often I'm guessing that the, the street children are going to be quite troubled. Um, probably from very low socioeconomic backgrounds and being able to work with them, especially as a girl and especially as a young girl. Um, I think it's all about just showing them the love and respect that you want to receive from them and um, like Latitude keeps telling us, when we're, we're not students anymore, we're actually part of the staff and um, but I think it's it's showing the respect to them and hoping that they'll show it back and I think yeah showing them unconditional love and I think if you do that you'll earn their respect. So are you nervous about anything else to do with the trip? Um not not so as much not so much nervous I've done I've been really blessed to have done quite a bit of traveling and, and seen how other cultures work and went on a missions trip with my school this year to Tonga and stay with a local family. So immersing myself in another culture, it, it's exciting and while it's hard at times, it, the, the benefits far outweigh any negatives. But I think one thing I'm most excited about would be the fact that I get to stay with a local family in Ecuador as well and building that relationship 
um, you know, I still talk to my family in Tonga. I still call my mum, my Tongan mum, and the, the children, my brothers and sisters, because even in a, in a two-week time frame, you know, you create a bond with people. And I think uh, nervous and excited to see the family that I get to stay with and the opportunities that I, I get through them. You say you want to take the message of self-worth. How do you teach that? Well, I've personally been through a lot with um, um, of troubles with self-worth, so um, eating disorders and and finding my way through that with you know help from friends and my church and my youth group and my faith. And I think being able to come out of that stronger than you were before. Um, and having the attitude that I didn't go through it for no reason and I want um, I want to share what I learned. And even if it's not that extreme, even if those issues aren't relevant to the children over there, I think, I think this world, wherever you are, is in need of some love, some unconditional love. And I think it's about showing these kids that, you know, whether they don't get it at home, that there's someone out there that cares about them and that they're worth more than they think they are. They are. And I think not so much, it might not, might not be in front of a classroom, you know, teaching them what I went through or sharing my story, but I think, like I said before, treating them like they're precious and like someone loves them. I think, I think that's priceless to a child, especially growing up, because that's when things like problems with self-worth um, really come into play and you don't, maybe won't see the, the, um, the problems that arise from that until later on in life. But I think, you know, if a child knows when they're young that they're worth something that some, and that someone loves them, then I don't think, you know, I think we can help to really eradicate those kind of problems in, in older youth. You have a passion for bringing happiness to people's lives. What drives that? Um, I don't know. I think maybe my faith in... Um, I'm a happy person and I, I strive to stay positive and I strive to, you know, see the light in, the, in things and the happiness in things. And I think I want other people to share in that joy that I feel. And, you know, there's no point going through life being sad or with a frown on your face. And I think people look a lot more beautiful when they smile and I want you know, I want to share that with people and I want to contribute in bringing that happiness to people and sharing in their happiness. And I think when you do that, you instantly make yourself happier and you're in a, you're in a happier place. And I, yeah, I think I just, I love serving people and I love giving things to people, even if it's just a smile, even if it's just, you know, a hello to a stranger or a, a hug to someone who may need it. And I think Happiness, I think we underestimate how easy it is to bring, how easy it is to give, and how easy it is to make someone's day. Truly inspirational young lady. If you'd like to help Natasha, you can visit givealittle.co.nz forward slash cause forward slash Natasha's passion. Up next, your weather and Toby Dale's fight to grow. Welcome back to Central News. Toby Dale is three years old and is an identical twin. Born prematurely, he suffers from Russell Silver syndrome, a rare growth disorder. To have a chance at a normal life, Toby needs growth hormone, which will cost the family between $10,000 and $15,000 a year for 10 years. A fundraiser at Classics Museum in Hamilton is being planned early in 2015 to raise these funds. Anne-Marie spoke to Tony Hamlin from Classics Museum and Toby's mum, Jackie, to find out what Toby's life will be like without the growth hormone. Um, he's going to always be struggling with growing and gaining weight, eating um, on a feeding tube for a lot longer, I don't know how long. I don't know exactly what it would be like without growth hormone, but I know that um, children like Toby don't um, get any higher in their growth percentiles, so he's not gonna reach his target heights at all. He's gonna come really, really short of those heights. How does it affect his muscle growth and his developmental process? He's lacking a lot of muscle mass, so he's really tiny and not very strong at all. So yeah, not having growth hormone is gonna affect him hugely, like like that, going to school, um, 
running around picking up things, his health day to day. So he's always sick every two to three weeks. He's sick and um, always in hospital. So with growth hormone, I think it'll help with his immune system as well and his energy levels. It costs a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, it costs a lot. How much? Somewhere around 10 to 15,000 a year. We haven't got an exact amount yet because it's based on weight for the dosage. Tony, you've heard about Toby and Jackie and their family and you want to do something to help. Why has Classics Museum thrown their support behind Toby and his family? Um, well, Classics Museum was originally set up as a family attraction. We wanted to set up something that would be here for the whole family to enjoy. That was our original vision, not just to have some cars for the boys to come and enjoy, but to encourage you know, the community to come along. So, you know, Toby's part of our community and we believe that he deserves a chance at having a life as close to the best life that he can have. And obviously this growth hormone is gonna make a huge difference to his life and we are really passionate about supporting him and getting this drug for him and hope that it will, will make his life a better life. You're planning a huge fundraiser early in 2015. Tell me about that. Yes, so we're having a cocktail evening. We're really excited to be holding that at the Classics Museum and Jukebox Diner. Um, we're still in the very early stages of planning the event, but at this stage we're hoping to have 120 people come along. We have JJ Harvey from <laughs> the Edge radio station and she will be emceeing for us, which is really exciting. And we hope to raise enough to get Toby through his first year um, with his drug hormone. And it should be an outstanding event. We're, we're um, approaching bands at the moment. We um, will have live auctions. And it should be a really nice upmarket event. If businesses want to help, what could they do? So they can help in a number of ways. Um, we're looking for sponsorship perhaps to um, someone to sponsor the band so that we, if we keep our cost to a minimum then all of the money that's um, paid for on the night will go towards um, Toby's growth hormone. Um, we're also looking for items for goodie bags or for silent auctions or live auctions on the night. So any small donation will be very much appreciated. Um, yeah, anything that anyone's willing to do, we're open for suggestions. Jackie, what does it mean to have the support of Tony and the Classic Museum behind you? It's overwhelming, it's fantastic, it's incredible. Yeah, I really, really, really appreciate it. To donate to Toby's Growth Hormone Fund, go to givealittle.co.nz forward slash cause forward slash fund Toby. You can also follow Toby on his Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Toby's Magic. And to find out more about the cocktail evening, visit Classics Museum Facebook page. Now it's time for our weather for Friday. for the marine forecast for our regions. That is the programme for today. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can via our Facebook page, centralnews.tv, or email us news at tvcentral.co.nz. Coming up on tomorrow night's programme, the marine app from Waikato that has won an award and it's 10 year plan time. Until then, I'm Hilary Entwistle. I hope you have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group.
Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.